So my plan today will be talking in particular about her uh, documentary, Tapri Tapestries of Hope, um, where she goes to Zimbabwe and works with um, different human rights activists around the issue of child rape in um, Zimbabwe due to misconceptions about AIDS. So let's welcome Michaeline um, to Google. Thanks. Thank you. I was asked by one of your colleagues to come and speak today, uh, and I, I'm grateful to be here. I thought the subject of courage would be the most appropriate, since courage, as we all know it, is the crux of the Google philosophy. The founders went against a tra traditional business school approach and opted for a less traveled path. If we build it, they will come, and they did. This approach took a lot of guts and a strong belief in their vision. I have also heard from other friends at Google that while the philosophy is still encouraged, it is extremely difficult to make such courageous choices as an individual working for what is now a huge organization. I am hoping that by telling you my story, it will inspire you in some small way because change only takes one person standing up and taking a less traveled path. I'll share a quote from you from my current book, which is right over there, it's called This Is Not The Life I Ordered. The author, Peter McWilliams, wrote these words. Come to the edge, he said. They said, we are afraid. Come to the edge, he said. They came. He pushed them, and they flew. What Mr. McWilliams was referring to here is, of course, courage. Each and every one of us have had that courage. For myself and the other authors of this book, we've been tested many times and had to dig very, very deep to find the reserves of courage that I believe is in each one of us. Courage is a lot easier to speak about or write about than live with. My personal story helped me develop and find my own courage, and let me tell you how. I came from an Italian Catholic family of six. My father was a plumbing and heating contractor. My mother was a housewife. I went to private Catholic school and was a cheerleader. I had lots of friends, and I, dated, I even dated the captain of the football team. Idyllic, pathetic, it depends on your perspective. Um, we had a, a wonderful family life. Many people said, my God, what a perfect family. Even our pediatrician used to say, you know, what, a, what an amazing family. But underneath that outside perception, there was a darker side. The darker side of our family that no one talked about. My mother came over from Italy as a child. My father was first generation born here. And with them, they brought, a lot of, they brought over a lot of old school ideas and a big bucket full of pride. So our family secret stayed within our family. And our family secret that I'm gonna talk a little bit about today is sexual abuse. I was seven when I was sexually abused by my older brother. He used to lure me into his bedroom with new toys. I was a fifth of six children, perhaps lost in the shuffle, and we had a very large extended family. Perhaps I thought that any attention was better than no attention at all. My father molested me as well, though I have much, much less memory of that. He also molested my best friend as we had a sleepover one night. We laid our sleeping bags on the floor and we were, fell asleep listening to Elvis Presley music. I must have dozed off because I awoke to the sound of my girlfriend saying, stop it, stop it. I was so terrified that I closed my eyes and pretended to be asleep. And it took me years to forgive myself for that. Afterwards, my girlfriend took me in the bathroom and told me what had happened. I was devastated and scared but still confronted my mother in the morning. I can still see her washing dishes uh, at the sink and her back was facing away from us. And I said, Mom, Mary Kay said that Dad put his hand down her pants. And my mother kept washing dishes. And I remember just kind of waiting for her to say something or do something. And she, once she was finished washing the dishes, she methodically dried her hands with a towel. And she turned around, she was so angry. And she turned to me and she said, how could you ever think that your father would do something like that? And I remember feeling incredible guilt. I, I just stopped and said, wow, what, I must be the worst daughter in the world. And I should tell you that my mother's response was 80% of the response to abuse in the family. So it wasn't atypical. It took me years to get through the process of grieving for what happened to me as a child. How did I do it? How did I turn my childhood traumas into a message of courage and hope? One thought never left my mind in the process, and that was I did not want my life to be defined by what happened to me. 
I refuse to let it be defined by what happened to me. I wanted my life to be about how I handled the cards that were dealt to me, what I made of the hand that I got. Those cards also represented me as a part of a disease so widespread as to be almost incomprehensible. I am talking about global violence against women and girls. This epidemic of violence represents one of the largest global problems facing humanity today. So how does this affect you? What relevance does it, what relevance does it have to you sitting here who've come to listen to me and to what I have to say today? Bear with me while I share some facts with you and the subject will become clearer. I had the privilege to speak at the United Nations in February. It was quite a humbling experience. The UN has been a leader in establishing the human rights of women. In 1979, the UN established the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. It's called CEDWA. This is the first authoritative human rights document designed to protect women. President, Car President Carter signed the documents and sent them to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to vote on in 1980. To date, in quite a series of debacles, the Senate has failed to ratify the treaty. The United States is the only developed nation that has failed to ratify the treaty, putting us in the company of Sudan, Iran, Somalia, and Zimbabwe. Because the United States did not ratify the treaty, as a country, we are not legally bound to protect human rights for women. Now, you may not think this is a big deal. Many people say, well, women's rights in the US are good. Why should this be an issue? Well, it sends a message that our country is not serious about protecting women's rights home and abroad. It also, our refusal to ratify is not only an international embarrassment, but it weakens our effective foreign policy. And it also increases the globe's perspective of the US hypocrisy. At a time when it seems there's a large global broom sweeping through issues of gender violence, I was grateful for Secretary General Ban Ki-moon's commitment to this issue and for his courage and leading by example. At a time when you look at how it affects our villages, our families, our lives, it is acute. The, but one of the things that seems to f make people focus on the issue more is the economic concerns. So if you look at, if you take away the human personal and emotional toll, you look at the economic toll and it is staggering. Let me just give you a few numbers to work with. The cost of partner violence in the U.S., this is just one phase of abuse against women, is roughly six billion dollars a year. In Canada, in a late study, 1995, the estimated domestic violence was the cost of one billion dollars a year. In the United Kingdom in 2004, again, just domestic violence, the cost was 23 billion a year. So we're just taking those three countries in one area, that's 30, 30 billion dollars. So if you look at that, and if, if you imagine it's roughly 30 million for just three countries in one category. And if we took the time to record and tally the global cost of all types of violence against women, it would be astronomical. When Winston Churchill referred to countries that ignored the threat of Adolf Hitler, he said, they go on in a strange paradox, decided to be undecided, resolved to be irresolute, adamant for drift, solid for fluidity, all powerful to be impotent. Think about it. Is our collective state of mind as human beings so unconscious that we refuse to see the consequences of our denial, the toll on our planet, the toll on our economies, the toll on each other. Violence against women and children represents a human rights plague. It affects every aspect of life on the planet, from health, welfare, and economic development. I include boys in this particular equation because many of their experiences as children bring them into the cycle of violence. There is no space on this earth, any continent or culture, ethnicity, or religion that is not affected by violence against women and girls. According to Amnesty International, one out of every three women worldwide are beaten, coerced into sex, or otherwise abused in their lifetime, with rates reaching 70% in some countries. Violence against women and girls is a human rights violation that causes physical, sexual, psychological harm and suffering. This includes rape, domestic violence, acid burning, dowry deaths, so-called honor killings, human trafficking, labia elongation, the list goes on. And these actions continue to devastate 
the lives of millions of women and children around the globe. Think about some of these additional statistics. Every hour in New Delhi, there will be two additional rapes, two kidnappings, four molestations, and seven incidents of domestic violence. In the United States, every two minutes, someone is sexually assaulted. It is estimated that half of the girls in Egypt and Ethiopia will be generally mutilated in 2008. And in parts of Africa, like Zimbabwe, which I'll show you, where the rate of AIDS infection is the number one country in the world, men believe that if they rape a virgin, they will cure their AIDS. In some parts of the world, close to 50% 50, 50 of rape victims are killed by their relatives to cleanse the family honor. So I ask you, what part of honor allows a rapist immunity and death to the victim? We use customs and traditions and patriarchal religions hiding behind the skirts of our gods to justify the violence. And I worry. In a study done at Clemson University, 51% of college-age boys said they would rape if they knew they would not get caught. This is a very current study. How do I teach my three young boys that violence against women is not okay when the world around them shouts a very different message? And on college campuses, According to a report conducted by the U.S. Department of Justice, for every 1,000 women attending a university, there will be roughly 35 incidents of rape. So let's just take a couple local colleges here. Stanford University. This year, there will be 125 attempted or completed rape victims. Berkeley, uh, a bigger undergraduate. Uh, there, are there are a larger number of women undergraduates. So this year, will be, there will be 447 attempted rapes um, on campus. It's pretty staggering when you think about it. I borrow a quote from the writer Anna Quinlan, and she says, I read and walked for miles at night along the beach, writing bad verse and searching endlessly for someone wonderful who would come along out of the darkness and change my life. It never crossed my mind that that person could be me. Think about that. Think about what she's saying. It never crossed my mind that that person could be me. I finally figured out what she was saying and turned my love of film and my passion for making a difference into full-time work. In 2003, I finally completed a film called Flashcards that was loosely based on my childhood. The film went on to win some national awards and was filmed at, it was um, shown at the Cannes Film Festival and we did the first national curriculum on child sexual abuse. Here's where it gets interesting because the Canadian Mounties approached me before the film was even complete, and they now use it to train their officers uh, dealing with families with rape and abuse. And uh, the film is also being used in Swaziland, South Africa, Zimbabwe, many, many parts of Africa. I have not been able to get the award-winning film used in the schools here at all, in the US. So it tells me that we have a long way to go. Last August, I went to Zimbabwe, a country in the southern part of Africa. It is a beautiful country. How many of you have been following Zimbabwe at all? Anyone? Okay, a few of you. So if you haven't been following, Zimbabwe is in the midst of a political crisis right now. Uh, the current president, Robert Mugabe, has been in power for 28 years. And he has, uh, in the last, since 2000, rigged the elections so that he would remain in power. Not only is it the unemployment rate at 80%, but um, there are at least a quarter of the population has fled the country, and poverty is at an all-time high. I think it was just a week ago that he actually stopped any kind of um, humanitarian effort from going into Zimbabwe anymore. So starvation is rampant. Part of, um, part of why I wanted to go over to Zimbabwe was to tell the story of Betty McConey. Betty McConey is a child rights activist in Zimbabwe, and she is an amazing human being. Um, she founded a group called the Girl Child Network, and basically what they do is they provide a haven for girls that have been raped or abused. And she's pretty amazing. I mean, I would watch her sit, and she would get text messages from people saying, help, help, you know, we have this young child. And she has a guy that works for her, this big, burly, you know, six foot three guy they call Mr. Rescue, and he literally goes in a white van, and goes out and just plucks these kids from the environment and brings them back to the empowerment villages. She is uh, just an incredible force to reckon with. 
So I wanted to tell her story. And when I went over there, Zimbabwe is also the number one AIDS capital of the world because of what I mentioned earlier, that men truly believe that if they rape a virgin, they'll cure their AIDS. And this is the traditional healers of Zimbabwe are much like our Western doctors. And so when a traditional healer says to his patient, in order for you to get rid of your AIDS, you need to rape a virgin, it happens. Um, as you can imagine, rape and AIDS are dramatically increasing. The age of the victims is decreasing. The youngest victim on record was a one day old. After one week of filming, 15 Central Intelligence officers arrested Betty McConey, my assistant, and myself. After two days of interrogation and a night in prison, Lauren and I were officially, unofficially deported out of Zimbabwe. I'm going to show you just a little bit of the trailer um, from the documentary. With your nice do, too. <laughs> she is my hero. Do you know what that means? Yes. And can I say the same? No. <laughs> Zimbabwe is a country in Southern Africa with a population of over 18 million. Zimbabwe is one country also affected by the HIV and AIDS pandemic. Issues around rape is rampant here. At least we get two cases per day, which are serious. One of the strongest myths that we have in Zimbabwe is that virgins or young girls can cure HIV and AIDS. The youngest one was a one-day-old child who was raped. With, with one day old, they, basically there is no sex. It's like you throw an atomic bomb right at, the, at this place. The genital parts are not even developed. They, they cannot even accommodate. There is nothing. And you discover that they can bleed a lot. The trauma is so much. There is so much pain. And they can just die. I cry for children. I want to Okay, go ahead. Look at the camera and say your name really loud. So she was raped. They thought maybe she would die because of her condition. But she's now fine. She's growing up. She's so bright. So that is a, a bit of the trailer from the upcoming film that we expect to have done by September. As you can see from there, um, after one week of filming, 15 Central Intelligence officers arrested Betty McConey, my assistant, and I. After two days of interrogation and a night in prison, we were officially deported, as I mentioned. But what I didn't talk about a little earlier were the prison conditions. Um, I don't think that I was ever more grateful for being a citizen of the United States than when I was in Zimbabwe in a prison. The conditions were deplorable. We were in a five by five cell with six other women. One was having an asthma attack. Another carried photos of herself. She had been so badly beaten by her spouse that she was unrecognizable in the photos. And she had been thrown in prison. The experience has forever changed me. I agonized in prison. Would I, would I ever make it home? How could I have been so selfish? What about my three boys? But when I got back, 
I was home and I was safe and sound. I, had, I, I was more determined than ever to tell the story. Was I terrified? You bet. Sometimes I still am when I think about what could have happened. I have met families still searching for loved ones in Zimbabwe. I have heard from some who have been tortured in Zimbabwe. I saw the beginnings of a man being tortured while I was in prison. And I've seen that these people are unfortunately never ever the same. My husband hired human rights lawyers. The US Embassy was involved. We saw no one from either of these groups in the three days of interrogation and incarceration. There was also no food or water. We had a Facebook site that, was, that I was blogging on from Zimbabwe. When I was arrested, the team sent out a note to the Facebook group and said, you know, we need to take everything down from the site. Uh, Michael Ian and her assistant have been arrested. And when he sent that note out, one of the guys who had joined our group early on in the process had happened to have a friend at the CIA. And he called up his friend and got us out of prison. Believe me, I know how lucky I am every single day. And we also got our film out. So I always use this, and I always say this, especially to uh, younger audiences, I say, you know, when your parents give you grief about Facebook, just tell them you know a woman who got out of prison because she was on Facebook. Fighting for justice or using passion takes on many forms, and it, all it takes is one person just to get up and say, this is not okay, no matter what that passion is or what that issue is. Um, I could not leave this stage without talking about humor a little bit. Humor has been a critical part of my life and it has saved me in many a situation. We used it in our book. I used it when I speak to groups, and believe me, we laughed in that prison cell. Um, the example I was gonna show you was from the founder of Finista.com, and it's on YouTube. It's a part of an awareness campaign for the situation in Burma. Go for Mandy. Yeah, I already knocked three times. He's not coming out. I've had water thrown at me. I, I've, I've had what I believe to be hemp seeds thrown at me. Okay, all right, I'll go again. You have to explain to me what's happening. I've been waiting in there for over two hours. This is costing us way too much money. Please, what does he need? A soy mate latte? What? No, it's not a caffeine thing. It's, okay. It's, uh... What? Are there chemicals in there that he can't breathe? You got the AC off. Okay, you got the AC off. What? So then tell me what the problem is. Um... Not coming out until Burma is free. What? Burma? Is that it? Honey, that, what? That's so doable. That's... Okay, done. Now, so... While I'm taking care of the Burma, yeah, uh, would, would you say like you need five, five minutes to Burma? Okay. So, you heard that. So, uh, just make that happen. Go free Burma. I don't really care how much it costs, just, okay. Now we are in the final stages of our documentary. In fact, in fact, Fatbox Films founder Rachel Russell is right here, and because of her and her husband, they've donated all post-production facilities to us, and we're able to finish the film. So I thank you very much. And they are local, and they're very high end, so you should know about them. Now my husband thinks um, that I'm crazy, and I planned on to go to Botswana in July. My hope is to meet up with Betty McConey and begin to create some kind of refugee camp for the people fleeing Zimbabwe. There are no relief groups there. Uh, we hope to actually get the UN and the Red Cross involved as well. But we feel that it's critical to get over there now. My husband, it took him a while to get used to it. Um, and I told him, be, be forewarned that you might have to navigate a tough situation for me again. And when he questions me about my sanity, I always quote from Gandhi, and I say, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. So 
I thank you very much for listening today. Is there questions? Questions at all? Yes. Um, if the traditional healers are telling people that they will, their AIDS will be cured by raving burden, and I'm assuming that's been being told for many years now, and no one's being cured and they're still dying, why is not that affecting well, I think it's, it, it's, um, there's a number of components to it. If you take it at face value, what has happened since it hasn't worked and there's such desperation is that they've actually started raping younger and younger children. So it's not unusual to hear of a one-day-old who's been gang raped. Um, and I don't say that for shock value. I say that that's how far it's gone. Um, Zimbabwe is not the only country doing that. It's uh, in many parts of Africa. I think that... Um, Traditional healers are losing their power. Western medicine is coming in. There is such a horrible disease happening that's eradicating so many people. And I think they feel powerless. So I wish it, it was a clean, this is why it's happening. And if we educated them, it would change. But that's not true because many of these perpetrators are college educated. And you would not be able to point one out on the street. These are not rural, ignorant people. These are educated family people who have their own children. So it is uh, much more complex, but I actually believe that if we applied some global pressure, that it might help the situation. And that's part of why we're doing the film. But great question. Yes? How many of the children who are raped end up getting HIV or AIDS? Uh, the majority of them. And, and for the children, for the girls particularly after being raped, it's not a question of if they get AIDS, it's when. Many of the girls in the empowerment villages, the Girl Child Network has three empowerment villages where they help girls. And there are virtually almost no boys. I'm not aware of a single boy who'd been raped in Zimbabwe. So it's not like they're ignoring the boys. But I have to say that it's just there's no issue, which is great. In other countries, there is still that issue. But I think that in the empowerment villages, she allows them to come in and they are there as long as they want. Many times they don't have the money for the AIDS test. So they usually find out by um, the symptoms as they get worse. In the documentary, we, we interview a number of girls that have AIDS and they're in the late stages of AIDS and they're not aware they have it. It's um, very sad to see. Yes? It's, it's a, a good question, too. I sat for two days with the traditional healers, um, and not only, most of them denied that they used this method, but then what was so interesting is in this, uh, these two-day meetings, I discovered that they have another practice they use right now called the Avenging Spirit Law. And what it is is if two tribes are in, in a, the same area and they get in a fight and one tribal member is killed, they actually deliver a virgin girl to them to have a baby, it basically rape until she has a, a boy child to replace that child. So just when I thought I was trying to get somewhere on the traditional healer side, they suddenly talk about this law called the Avenging Spirit Law, which they practice every day. So I think it's, it's much more ingrained culturally from the beginnings. And if this helps at all, part of why they believe uh, that girls can cure AIDS is that they believe a, a young girl's blood is, is all powerful. And so they actually take, they'll, they'll kidnap young girls and take a syringe and take a vial of blood out of their body and put it in their stores so that they can bring in riches and success. So I think there's a little bit of voodoo, a little, you know, and I wish I could say it's education, but I come back to, I think, I really believe that global pressure will help stop these kind of activities. There's nothing like shame that helps people realize that what they're doing is wrong. Any other questions? Yes. Not really. They they can have access to AIDS drugs. They're struggling right now. All the empowerment villages have been closed. All the kids have gone back to families. Um, the little girl Ranyato, the the smallest one, the three year old, she was raped by uh, a relative and then dumped into a garbage bin. And the only person coming to claim her was her relative who had raped her. And so we, they had no choice when uh, Mugabe closed the camps to send them back home. So right now there's nothing available. And part of why I'm going over to Botswana is to set up a satellite girl-child network. But um, 
there is one other aspect of that too. President Mugabe, Western medicine sends medicine over, but Mugabe does not use it locally. He um, basically stores it and sells it to other countries. Okay, any other questions? Good. Well, uh, believe me, I still have nightmares over that. It was, um, they were convinced I was CIA. And I'm a pretty progressive, so it was kind of ironic. And I, um, at first, I had not realized how seriously, how serious it was. Because I couldn't imagine, we had gotten permission to go in the country. We were doing this story about young girls. I couldn't imagine why we were arrested. And then, when we got in there, they were, uh, you know, I at one point had to sit down with the head of the Central Intelligence Organization, and I literally went through my work history. And I remember having to explain to him what Kentucky Fried Chicken was, which was my first job. <laughs> and it was very surreal. He had an AK-47 hanging on a nail, and um, he had little, um, the, the little uh, grenades on his desk. So they were very, very uh, capable of violence. They do it every day. They're there, you know, they, they do it every day. But I think that um, once, you know, even though we tried to convince them I wasn't CIA, it, it didn't matter. They went through all our tapes. I think the worst part was when we were in prison because it was an overcrowded co-ed prison. And um, I went walking in there and one of the police officers who was a woman, I turned to her and I said, Maria, you know, do I have to worry about rape in here? And she kind of laughed and she said, oh, you Americans, you know, you don't have to worry about rape. You'll have your own separate cell and you'll have your own toilet. And believe me, that wasn't the case. Um, and without Zimbabwe dollars, uh, I don't know what would have happened because I bribed my way through prison um, to every shift. And uh, yeah, it was a, you know, imagine, you know, a building you see here completely gutted and I could see literally see up to the fourth floor from the holes in the ceiling. And there's no food or water. People actually die in prison there from hunger. So, believe me, uh, I would not go back to Zimbabwe right now because um, if, you know, if you look at what's happening with the current political climate, um, people are getting killed and you never see them again. Yes. I did, but I, I don't because we're working directly with the government. It's been a democracy for 41 years, and um, we hope to work directly with the Red Cross there. So, you know, President Mugabe and his militia are not going to come to Botswana. They're, they're not going to be welcome there. So, no, not in the same way. I don't find myself in harm's way there. You know, famous last words. <laughs> so, but, but I really believe it's a much safer place. Thanks, Kelly. Anything else? Okay. Why, well, thank you very much for listening today. Thank you.